My name is Eva Rain. I went to Detroit to follow the case of Kelly Stowe, a black trans woman killed in 2018 by a pastor. You shot my child. You didn't even stay there to hold her hand and say a prayer with her? That's not God. One of your sisters or daughters or mothers may not be here because of someone who loved them, but also will kill them. I did want to hear about Kelly's death and what it says about why men keep killing us. The world is is off kilter in our family. Yeah. It gets heavier and heavier each time. How many people have you lost to violence? I stopped keeping count. But I really want to hear from people who loved Kelly and how their fight to honor her is also a fight to keep their community safe. The trans girls here, they're resilient, they're prideful, they're strong, and we've withstood the test of time. This is Transnational. Energy just keep going down and down. I need to keep that energy up. Here we go. Who wanna be the last thing to be the joint? I am the court, not here with the joint. We are here in Detroit. This is the last ball of the season. Right now, it is hot as hell. are watching Butch Queen Vogue, Femme Queen Realness, Glitz and Glam and everything in between. It's been really, really cool to just see everybody really in their element, having fun, and feeling safe within their own community. Ladies and gentlemen, the new godmother, the twin godmother, Lady Anna. P-O-N-Y-E, P-O-N-Y, the new godmother, the new godmother. Detroit's ballroom is like no other ballroom. I think that my community is beautiful. I think Detroit's ballroom world is a reflection of the resiliency and beauty in black and brown LGBT culture. I've been around for a long, long, long time ballroom kind of helped save me. Ballroom taught me a lot as far as giving me those first-hand lessons in advocacy. Ballroom to me is another safe haven. It was my outlet for when I was stressed. I think that we find a way, we find beauty, we find fun, and we like work hard as hell to try to make sure that no one else has to go through some of the things that we've went through or some of the things that our sisters have went through. A Detroit area pastor is going to trial for the murder of a transgender woman. The body of 36-year-old Kelly Stowe was found early Friday morning in the area of East McNichols and Brush. Tonight, 46-year-old Albert Weathers is charged with her murder. Weathers is from Sterling Heights, and investigators confirm he is a pastor at a church in Detroit. A source close to the investigation says there was a witness and that Albert Weathers only called police an hour after the shooting and after he clocked into work at the Great Lakes Water Authority. Another witness referred to herself and Kelly as survival sex workers and she says they've met Weathers before. It's June 2021, and at least 29 trans people have already been killed in the U.S. this year. That's 29 of us, most of them black and brown trans women. Police fail to stop our killings. Media rarely covers our deaths. In middle America, our cases get so little attention, you might not even know we ever died or lived here. I came to Detroit to find out about Kelly Stowe, a Detroit native, a lover of fashion, and a beauty enthusiast. The night of her death, Kelly was on the stroll, 
a meeting ground for trans sex workers and clients. A local pastor, Albert Weathers, killed her there. Weathers says he was in the area looking for a gas station when she jumped in his car demanding money. Weathers claims he acted in self-defense, saying Kelly tried to rob him and came at him with something sharp, and then he accidentally fired his gun at her. A witness testified that he watched Weathers throw Kelly out of the car and leave. Weathers left for work. He clocked into his job and waited until an hour after the shooting to report it to the police. Kelly died on the street. This all happened in December 2018. Since, the case has been on hold, and a trial date hasn't been announced. So I'm learning about Kelly's life and death, but also what it's like for her community here without her. Kelly was a member of the legendary House of Ebony, and I met up with her bottom sister, Liliana Reyes, who directs a drop-in center for kids at a local LGBTQ center. This space really was created and uplifted by Ruth Ellis. She was a black lesbian who owned a business and who allowed young people, young black and brown LGBT people to, to one dance, she believed in dancing, and to just be wherever they are and feel safe. This space is open Mondays and Wednesdays. We see youth who don't have houses, who don't have families, who don't have much of anything except coming here, feeling loved, getting services. It was ballroom how you met Kelly Stowe, right? Yes, it was the ballroom scene. We were in the same house, the House of Ebony. Uh, we all walked the same category. So I used to walk femme queen face, which is more trans woman face, and she walked drag queen's face. It was still the glitz and glam of face and the over the top gowns and the big hair that brought us together. So we were two big girls, so we were tall and big. And we were very boisterous and very loud, if you can believe it. And she uh, was probably one of the funniest people. And so she helped me kind of get over some of my shyness. What did her role here look like? Um, so she was not really a community activist that got paid. She believed that the girls should feel safe. She believed that sex work should be legal. She believed that folks wouldn't do sex work if they didn't have to, and so they shouldn't be criminalized for something that they really don't have any choice, because it's either that or starve for many of us. And so she was vocal when people didn't really want to hear it. How did you first react when you heard about her murder? Over the course of my life, I've lost a lot of sisters. Being a part of many systems and institutions, you're often the first to know. We have to be able to navigate that pain and trauma while still helping other people. Anytime a trans woman gets murdered, it feels like a piece of my soul leaves. So when it happened to Kelly and it was so close to home, it wasn't just a piece of my soul. It was like, they do not like us. They do not like trans women. They don't care about us. They don't care about our lives. They don't care about any of it. And the thought that someone could look at Kelly and think that she was disposable is just ridiculous. So it was, it was hard. How many people have you lost to violence? I stopped keeping count. I don't remember in terms of number. I remember in terms of, I'm so bad, when I had to tell other people that someone passed away. I remember sometimes being the first person to know that someone went missing, or the first person to know because someone on our board would go to the forensics person and like identify the body. I remember every instance that happened. But I stopped keeping track of numbers because I felt like they were just all coming together so soon and so quick and so, so hard. Yeah, I don't even pay attention to the numbers anymore. Oftentimes, cisgender men want to love us in the dark, but want to hide us in the light. These guys get scared of people knowing they're attracted to us, and they attack. Data on trans people is hard to come by. The Human Rights Campaign has only been keeping track of trans murder since 2013. It estimates somewhere between 44 and 74 percent of trans victims since then have been killed by someone they knew, including someone they've been intimate with. Fearing this violence is an everyday part of navigating life as a trans person. At the Ruth Ellis Center, Liliana leads a chat between trans women and femmes to share their experiences. 
You know, when you cross your ankles, your knees are supposed to be touching. You see, that's why I'm sitting at a pivot. <laughs> I learned it from Princess Diaries. An ankle? Yeah. You get to a mom dressed like your mom because she thinks she's slick. <laughs> so the cameras are here, so I'm not gonna repeat, but those are those are what we girls wear when we don't feel like doing certain things. Oh, you wear yeah, a skirt. I'm, I'm yep. Tucking one on one. So let's do introductions first. If you can tell me your name and what does freedom look like to you? Who wants to start? My name is Amaria, pronouns she, her, and hers. And freedom looks like this to me, being with my girls, being with everybody, and just no limits of communication, empathy, and protection. Good afternoon, I'm Janice Poindexter. Um, freedom to me is without bounds, um, but I don't know it because we live in America. Period. I think freedom to me looks like seeing a world where I don't have to lose my sisters uh, because someone didn't like who they were. There's been a lot in the community is about violence towards girls like us, um, from people who are supposed to love us or people who just can't love us because they don't want to or because we're just in the store living our authentic lives and someone doesn't like us. What does that feel like as a girl to know that your life could be a ticking time bomb or that one of your sisters or daughters or mothers may not be here because of someone who loves them but also will kill them? I feel like my humanity will be taken away because we get so wrapped up in the experiences of us women being trans, we shouldn't have to only exist in this space right now. We should wake up and be like, what I'm gonna wear today? Not, oh, let me put this makeup on so they can't, you know, get me together, mm -hmm. clock me, or nobody won't kill me. When you look on the news and YouTube and all this other stuff, you look at the comments, they're like, oh, well, she was probably tricking him or she probably deserved it. We should all just be able to be ourselves, especially in certain situations like dating and stuff like that without fear of being murdered simply just for being us. It gets heavier and heavier each time we continue to be let down by the judicial system. We all hope for justice and we all hope for some sort of recourse, um, but more often times than not, um, we don't get it. And that's because our lives have no value in the systems that we navigate and that we have to come in contact with on the day-to-day -day basis. And that's what makes it so heavy. You have to live every day like it's your last. Albert Wathers claimed he didn't know Kelly was trans. But during a pre-trial hearing, one of Kelly's house sisters testified that Albert Wathers knew exactly who Kelly was because he was a regular client on the stroll where Kelly's house sister also worked. Her name is Kyra Butts. I, I didn't quite get your name. It's uh, Butts, is that correct? My name is Kyra. What's your real name? Excuse me, whoa. That is extremely insensitive and inappropriate. No, 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 it's not. Let me say this. There's a Sixth Circuit opinion that says I have a right to know who the identity of the person is on a witness stand. And case. you know it. And that's all I'm asking. And, and then when I read Discovery, there's reference to different names. I have a right to ask that. There's nothing intimidating to what a good lawyer does, Your Honor. Yes, yes sir. Please, uh, uh, she also said in open court with her hand raised that she swore that her name was but she said she yes. goes by Kyra. This is where we usually come and hang out. And also, this is the park that we've been hanging at for years, like mm -hmm. even back in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, it's a really pretty park. This is the stroll up here, right? Um, when you see the cars, okay. that's where the stroll is. How did you first meet Kelly? Me and Kelly met in 2009 in Chicago on a ball weekend. We were both in the House of Ebony, so that's how we met, and from there, we built the relationship. There's that clip of you speaking at the pre-trial. What are some things that you want other people to know about what that felt like? I had experienced a lot of trans murders, a lot of um, associates and friends passed before, but this one was specifically personal to me. So I feel like I had to do something about that. I had to face 
one of my best friend's murderers. Like, I had to look them in the eye. That was the first time we looked each other in the eye since then. Do you know a person uh, who is Albert Weathers? Yes. Do you see him in the court today? Yes, I do. For the record, could you please indicate where he's seated and what he's wearing? He has on the green Wayne County outfit. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant in this case, Albert Weathers. In response, how do you know Albert Weathers? We've had prior engagements in the past. When you're talking about engagements, what do you mean? Hookups, like sex work. He was one of the guys that I hooked up with. And when you were working with Kelly, did you and Kelly ever encounter Mr. Weathers together? She didn't get in the car, but yes, we he was rode past and we saw him and had discussions about him. And when you say rode past, can you please explain to the court how it works when you're on this roll? Generally, the, I'm going to call them giants. The giants, they ride typically looking, you know, trying to see who they want, if they want to pick someone up. And he would drive around a lot before he would pick someone up, so. Do you have knowledge of Mr. Weathers picking up other trans women? Yes. Okay. How do you have that knowledge? I've saw him pick up other women. And like, we have discussions about the people we mess with sometimes. And when you say we have discussions. Hold on, hold on. When you say we have discussions, who are you talking about? We as in the other girls that I know that I've worked with out on the streets. Okay, so you would also personally see Mr. Weathers engaging with other trans women? Yes. And Kelly Stowe was one of these women that yes. worked in the same area with Objection. you? Objection. Yes. Yeah. Weathers' his lawyer said in court that the suggestion of his sexual relationships isn't relevant to the case. He filed a motion to exclude testimony about whether Weathers had relationships with sex workers, but the judge denied it. Weathers maintains his innocence and denies that he knew Kyra or Kelly or frequented the stroll, and his lawyers plan to defend him against all charges. How common are guys like Albert Weathers? They're everywhere. Guys like him, they are everywhere. They are all around us, like they pastors, firefighters, people who work at McDonald's, the guys at the gas station. Like, they're everywhere. But you just have to wait for them to do something ignorant to find out who they are, most of them. Oftentimes, a lot of these guys, as soon as they get, like, found out, that's kind of what leads to these murders and it leads to violence and it leads to this whole culture with like all of their shame. I think that it's selfish because um, we shouldn't be a secret. Yeah. Um, I'm not asking every guy to just accept every trans woman and date them and marry them, you know what I'm saying? But have respect. And if you are what they call messing around with the trans woman, like let that be that. Like. I think a lot of people have a fear that they'll get caught, and then that probably turns into them making dumb decisions. Her murder kind of, it kind of opened up a lot of people's eyes, especially since he was a pastor, she was a trans woman. After she passed, that's what actually made me want to turn my life around even more. Like, I just knew that I had to let it go all together. Like, I went and got me a job, I went and got me a car, and I turned my life around as much as I could. For one, because it was personal to me. And for two, I didn't want to be the next Kelly Stuff. This was at uh, my mother's uh, 70th birthday party we gave her. Oh, wow. And this is, this is Kelly. <laughs> when we would have family functions, she would tend not to come to too many because she always felt that everybody would be, you know, people would be staring at her and take away from what the moment is about. I had talked to her and told, just come, Grandma would love for you to be there. Who cares what nobody, this is for Grandma, it's for Grandma. So you would think Grandma was the mother. She liked her more than me, but that's okay. <laughs> Oh, these are beautiful. Aren't she beautiful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your favorite memories with Kelly? Oh, y'all yeah, did. So many. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Swim meets. Kelly could sing and go into performances in church because Kelly could play the tambourine like a professional <laughs> and it would be hilarious. Yeah. If one of the older, uh, 
uh, uh, church members would ask for the tambourine, Kelly would gl glare, <laughs> resentment, like, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the swimming, yeah. Oh, swimming. it'd be so hot in there. I'm like, what? Family members don't come to swim meets? I see why, because it'd be so hot in there. <laughs> when, she be so... In, when she jumped in, she jumped in half the length of the pool. Like... It was our yeah. baby, too. Yeah. It wasn't just her baby. It was yeah. all of our baby. It was. You wouldn't know who was the mother. When Kelly decided to transition, he moved away and kind of kept a lot from them. He shared, she shared a lot with me, but just wanted to protect us. When he said that she feels strong, she feels empowered, that really kind of gave it life. Like, whoa, it make you feel like that? Okay. Yeah. You know? That's how it was when I told yeah. my mom, you know? <laughs> it took a lot. Um, and I still haven't really spent time around my aunties and my uncles because I've been scared too, right? I struggled with the transition. We're opinionated, fierce toward one another and our opinions out of love. And I struggled because I think I was afraid for Kelly because I knew how the world would treat her. I was the total opposite, like, okay, really? Okay, let's find a doctor. Let's look into programs. Let's research how you can get money to fund operations. If you're gonna do it, at least be fly while you're doing it. Nah. <laughs> you know, whatever yeah. you wanna do, just be amazing at it. So she got it from both sides. And I just, I've always just accepted it and wanted her to be the best version of herself. Helped me to understand that it wasn't a choice. It was not a choice, and I did not get that. I didn't understand that when he started meeting people, and they, you know, he, she would tell me, "Oh, well, she, you know, she's been on her own since she was 14. Her parents, you know, put her out, or she's been on her own since she was 15. She didn't get along with her mother, you know." And I'm thinking, how do you do that as a parent? But definitely missed, as you can see, a lot of, of lot of memories. Definitely missed. She is missed. The world is is off kilter in our family. Yeah. It's off kilter. We are knocked sideways and we will never be righted. It's like one of the group is missing. Albert Wattis' motion hearing for the killing of Kelly Stowe is happening today. The trial has been delayed for years now. The killing happened all the way back in 2018. This trial has been delayed for various factors, COVID, everything that happened in 2020. FC, people of the state of Michigan versus Albert Weathers, here today for a motion hearing. Appearances for the record. Good morning, Mr. Weathers, can you state your name for the record? This is Albert Weathers. Every year we see headlines reading that this is the deadliest year for trans murders, whether it's 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021 but we don't actually know what the deadliest year is. Oftentimes, these murders are going totally unreported, whether it's people being scared to talk to the police, people scared to talk to the media, the media totally misgendering people, or just a lack of momentum around these trials. What does justice look like to you? That man behind bars. Just behind bars and to pay for the sadness and the injustice he's done. You know, to be a pastor and 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 know that you've you you've shot my child. You didn't even stay there to hold her hand and say a prayer with her. You just leave her, go away. That's not God. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you 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 kill my baby or, you know, to, to cover up your own sins of uh, being a pastor. And, you know, you have to answer to that. Because uh, I'm still working on that myself. The hate, you know, and the, the anger. You know, and I try not to focus on that because um, he can't take anything else from me. He's not gonna pull me out of my square and, and make me this person that I'm not because I'm upset, you know? So 
you don't have that kind of power. Mm -mm. I won't give it to him. Mm -mm. What is something that you want Christians to, to know when it comes to loving their trans brothers and sisters? I told Kelly, because she's Christian and she was concerned about that. If God would still love her, you know, because of her wanting to be or is trans. You know, as a parent, I, don't, I didn't have an answer. I just said, I don't know. I don't know. But all I can say is, you know, you have to live, just live your best life. And I think she did. I think she did. In nearly half the country, Weathers could be charged with a hate crime in addition to his murder charge. But Michigan is one of 13 states where the hate crime law doesn't account for violence based on sexual orientation or gender identity. In 2019, State Senator Adam Hollier co-sponsored legislation to amend that. The bill was voted down. When we look at some of the murders against trans people, there's intimate partner violence in, involved, but one partner doesn't want to be found out and then something really horrible happens. When does intimate partner violence become a hate crime? It's a hate crime if you kill someone for hateful reasons, right? So if you kill someone because they're a transgender person, that is enough. But when we talk about intimate partner violence, uh, particularly against transgender women, it comes out of a space of hate, of a shame, a man who is in a relationship with a transgender woman and kills that transgender woman because he doesn't want to be found out is not just killing her because she's a transgender woman. He is killing her because he is afraid people will know that he had a relationship with one, that he loved her, that he liked her, that he was attracted to her because that was so shameful. That was so hard. That was so scary for him that living in a world where people knew that that's who he was was too much for him. Let's say man has been charged with the murder of a trans woman. How does adding a hate crime charge impact the overall case? So oftentimes it's not murder that you need the hate crime addition for. It's the space where somebody did something that was hateful, that was intimidating, that is otherwise not a crime. They burned a cross in your yard. People know that that was hateful. That's not acceptable. You can't do that. But can you start to kick at you know, a trans woman. If you threw something in her face because she was just living, does that say, oh, you're not welcome in this neighborhood, you're not welcome in this community? That's not your freedom of speech, that's you trying to say something to a community, not just to that one person. That's why we have to change the law, that's why we have to provide protections for these folks. When we don't take these things serious, when we just let it be one of those kind of things of, well, that was just a murder, that was a whatever, then it tells people, particularly in the community, that we don't understand that it sends a message, that it was meant to send a message, and that it does. So could you talk about where we are right now? Yes, so we are on the grounds of our new space that we're building to combat homelessness, particularly for the LGBTQ community, um, with special focus on the trans population. We know that there is a lack of allocated resources that comes from the state and comes from the city. And so this is kind of our answer to that. I am one of the people in charge of the housing department, um, particularly the project that is named after our sister Kelly Stowe. One in five trans people have been homeless at some point in life. And estimates say as many as 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. It is the answer for so many problems um, for the women and the gentlemen of our community. And when I tell you, we have thought of everything, even the ballroom culture. So there's a space that will be in here um, where you can come and have a mini ball. There'll be no cap on age. There'll also be no cap on the duration. If you feel that you need to occupy this space for two years, and that's what you need, that's what we're here for. Let's be very clear, it's some rainy days. 
<laughs> it's some it's some dark days or, or some hurdles that you got to climb. And you want to be able to come home and connect with people or feel a sense of a safety net. These type of spaces and, and this intentionality, it really wasn't around when I grew up. Today is Mother's Day. We are here at Liliana's house. Thank you. People oftentimes think of Mother's Day as something that's only for your given family, something to only ever celebrate your birth mother. But for queer and trans people, especially black queer and trans people, a mother can literally be anybody. For instance, Janice is actually Liliana's mother. Liliana is mother to many, many kids, and many of them are here with us today. This one did. Huh? It don't matter, nah. <laughs> You a hateful ass bitch. That's what you are. I just wanted to look, you know. Look, I Junior. I all the channels to hear. Look, I was hey, like, oh, how oh, oh, nice. Oh. I said, but when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> hateful, boring ass bitch. Many LGBTQ people are so rejected by their given families, so we get chosen ones. <laughs> What's she doing now? Over for you. It is! I love it! <laughs> I'm glad this is on because it'll kind of help steer our conversation. We are on the ballroom scene, like, yeah, this is hoes. We family, you know. Today is Mother's Day. That's my daughter. She's your friend, she's your sister. How have the relationships that you built or that you maintain? Um, with the people in this space, how have they added to you in what way? So that's just part of the conversation. Nothing too deep, nothing too serious. Nothing too deep. I, I don't think it's that deep. I don't think it's that deep. <laughs> okay, well, in the spirit of Mother's Day, Liliana is my mother. In 2009, that's when I left my biological family because we had a lot of differences when it came to my sexuality. And when I went to the University of Michigan, I met Liliana there. Um, she was studying there and I was studying there as well. I began to be real inspired by her because I'm like, you are working on a master's degree, which she has now. I'm a cisgender male. And I'm like, you're a trans woman and you're doing things that I don't even see myself doing. And that's really why I want her to be my mom because I feel like she inspired me to do better. So she do. Like, even though I'm her mom, like, it's not, it's not just a take, take, take. As much as I give her, she gives me. And to this day, I always tell her how lucky I feel and blessed I feel to have her as a child. But you being my mother, um, being under your leadership and your influence in Barroom helped me a lot in many ways. I knew that if I called you, that you would be there. But like in 2016, um, when I went, take my own life and um, <laughs> my doorbell just run and I was ignoring everybody but somebody just told me to answer the door. I went to answer the door was Janice and um, she just held me tight and just prayed and cried and cried together. I'll be forever grateful you know that I had that I, I had her for that you know, with me in that moment. I remember that. I do. I remember, I didn't know. I didn't know what to say. I just knew I had to get over there to you, and I knew that I had to pray. That was the best thing that I could do. Wasn't nothing to give you or to do. It's just to just be there and just pray. Yeah, I talked. <laughs> right. We just said we wasn't gonna go too deep. <laughs> Bitch, if I had on lashes. <laughs> what does being a mother mean to you? Oh my goodness. It's everything to me. These are relationships that have been cultivated and molded um, 
down through the years, like so many years. A lot of them have lived in my home. I've always opened up my home to them. Um, anybody can get together and be a family or be a clique. Um, but I think when you really have that like family structure, there's just a uh, love and respect that transcend last name because of the importance of coming together, loving each other, and really supporting each other. And a lot of that came from ballroom. I would be definitely remiss or lying if I didn't admit that. So it plays a really critical role in my life and in the lives of so many people. Spending a week with my trans brothers and sisters who knew Kelly, all I see is love. Love she had for her community and love her community had for her. When I see them voguing, I see our power, our magic, and our strength. We'll see what happens with Albert Weathers. He's out on bond. His lawyers wouldn't talk to us about the case because it's ongoing or any of the charges or allegations against him. A trial date still hasn't been set. Whatever happens, we'll always have each other. DJ, pause for me. It's one person here in motherfucking Detroit that always, always, always put on for this city. And bitch, I call her the Congress Ramen. She's my motherfucking mother. Ladies and gentlemen, DJ, pump that beat, cause she gotta come out here. Yes, Jamie's Icon. Jamie's I Z O N Jamie's Mama Bear, Mama Bear, Mama Bear. Can we pause the music? It's important not only to do your work in the community, but also outside the community. And everything you do does not need acknowledgement. And this lady does that day in and day out. Day in and day out. Speaking with congressmen and congresswomen to make sure that our rights are being spoken about. Fighting in our communities to make sure we have rights and safe havens and safe spaces to go to. So please give this lady her roses while she is here in front of you. Yes, you do. Icon. Y'all give her a round of applause. I love you. <laughs> what makes the trans community here in Detroit so special? I think we get a bad rap automatically just because we're from Detroit. So when I think about particularly the girls, the trans girls here, they're resilient, they're prideful, they're strong, they're smart, they're intelligent and we've withstood the test of time. We still stand, we still thrive. It is really like a family reunion. And I think when sometimes people say that they think of the negative of family reunion, but if you think of that positive space where people you love, people have helped you out, people who are your resource, and really might be one of the reasons why you're still alive. 